I want to close our time today as we've been talking about purpose by talking about how to find purpose in the void. How to find purpose in the void. And what do I mean by void? I mean just think about just a big expanse. Think about a, a, a gap maybe in service. Think about a, an abandoned place. How do you find purpose in that place? Before I get to that, I just want to ask you a question. Uh, you don't have to call it out, but I want you to get an image in, in your mind. What is your greatest fear? What is your greatest fear? Uh, for some of you, the, we'll make one more Falcons joke. They have fulfilled all your greatest fears in the, in the first three weeks. We were, we were hoping for more. I know it's early, but please do the onside kick practice quickly. You just do, do something. Uh, but what is your greatest fear? I mean, for some people, your greatest fear would be for me to ask you to get up from the chair that you're in right now and to be up here. Uh, for others of you, your greatest fear is maybe uh, something physical, something maybe you feel silly about. Maybe it's it's heights. Maybe it's snakes. Maybe it's closed-in spaces. I, I don't know uh, what your greatest fear is. A lot of times our fears, we don't even understand why we have the fears that we do. It's something that happened to us when we were kids, our big brother or little sister did it to us or whatever it is, but we have these massive fears. And I have been thinking recently about what's my greatest fear? Because at one point in my life, I might have said snakes, but that's only because when I was a kid, I liked Indiana Jones and he said his greatest fear was snakes. And so I figured that would be mine too because it was a cool fear. But being a dad of two boys and a wife who has legitimate fears of snakes, I've had to dismiss and remove quite a few snakes now in my life. And so I can confidently say something like that is no longer a fear. But I do have a great fear. I have a fear that I wrestle with, I think, every single day. It's the idea that I would get to the end of my life and I wasn't able to give fully of myself to my life. That I wasn't able to be completely me. That I wasn't able to give fully of myself to my wife, to my boys, to my community, to my church, to the things that are important to me. That I, for some reason, would feel hemmed in or I would allow other people's opinions or comparisons or whatever it might be to cause me to hold back. I have a fear of holding back. And not being fully me. We, we all do it a little bit every day, don't we? Kind of, we check ourselves. We check ourselves. Don't say that. Don't do that. Sometimes that, that's actually a good thing to have that filter. I, I strongly recommend a filter every day. Maybe a couple of filters for some of you to work through. But sometimes it's really helpful to check yourself. But sometimes we hold back and we really don't know why. Other than it's a fear of other people's opinions or of failure, or of looking foolish, of not standing up too high for the fear of what other people might say about us. Who do you think you are? Why do you think you should be the one to speak into that? You have no right. And I have a fear of getting to the end of my life and looking back and saying, man, why did I hold back? Why did I hold back? In 2007, I came into a new position at our church. I've been at our church since we started. 1997, we began September of that year. We were meeting in an elementary school in Cobb County. And I was the kids pastor. And we've, I've seen a few Jim, Qualen, Jim Collins quotes today. I used one a little bit ago. And the whole idea for us, I, I've been on the right bus, but I've moved around the bus. And so I moved into different positions on the bus. And I moved into this position as a... Uh, as a pastor where I was asked to be responsible for all the outreach at the church. Not just all the local outreach, which I've been doing for years along with the kids position, but also all the global outreach. And I decided, you know what, I'm new to this position. I really want to, I want a quick win. You ever have that? You ever come into a, a new office, a new department, whatever it is, and say, I want to establish myself and I want to get a quick win. I've been at the church for 10 years, but I wanted to get a quick win. And so the elders of the church had a year previously, almost an entire year before, had made the decision that our church would get involved in Africa. 
And through the introduction with another missionary, it was determined that we would get involved in this little country called Burkina Faso, one of the poorest countries in the world. 87% of the people of Burkina Faso cannot read. That mirrors their unemployment rate. 87% not working. They're literally just every day just trying to survive. One in 3.4 children die every day before the age of 10. I had a missionary literally do this to me. He stood 15 kids up in front of me and numbered them all. He counted down the line. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And he said to me, the ones won't be here the next time you come. I mean, it's extreme poverty. I've, I've met people from Togo and Benin and Cameroon and Ghana, and I've told them that we work in Burkina Faso. And people from other West African countries have looked at me and said, oh, that's real poverty. And we, we did this vision trip all around the country. And i got to be honest, I wanted to get a quick win, but I'm, I'm going to confess something. Geographically, I was a little challenged before this trip. I didn't really know where I was going. Africa. I knew I was going that way. Sort of knew. Right before I left, I told my wife, let's pull it up just to see where I'll be. And we pulled it. That's how ignorant I was. I'll tell you something else in my ignorance was I just figured no matter what happened, I was going to come home sick. I was going to touch something, breathe in something, something was going to happen, and I was going to catch some kind of disease. And so, I mean, you want to talk about, I know we've been using hand sanitizer in 2020, but I'm telling you, like, it's my job. Everything, everybody, everything that I touch, just hand sanitizer. I mean, I could not have looked more like tourists, looked more like, I had to have just looked silly, quite honestly, in all the things I was doing. And I remember being standing out in one particular place. And as you guys know, as I've been introduced, I'm a pastor, I'm a person of faith. I want to invite everyone just to go there with me for just a moment, okay? I'm standing in what could only be described as a slum area, the poorest area of the capital city, the only capital city in the world without a natural water source, a little area that, as the city is divided up into sectors, called Sector 30. And I'm standing out in this area... And there, there are kids that have been around, and one particularly could not be older than three years old, and he is crying, and he is pouring sweat and pouring snot. Just, I, just to look at him, I thought, there's just germs everywhere. As a person of faith, I felt a nudge from God, what I would say would be God's spirit. I didn't hear anything audible, but I felt a nudge. God said, pick him up. And I said, no. Excuse me? I'll pick that one up. God said, no, pick him up. And so, truly wrestling with God. I picked up this little boy, and I'm holding him so far out away from me. From a distance, it looked like this beautiful Lion King moment, Elton John in the background. I'm holding him up. But I'm just trying to keep him as far away from me as possible and still be obedient. And if God laughs, he's laughing and said, no, pull him in, hold, hold him, pull him in and hold him. And in West Africa, you may not figure out, like, the kids don't have everything that our kids have. So, I mean, he had little shorts on, but I mean, at any time, a whole lot more could have been happening than I wanted to happen. <laughs> so I'm just holding him close. And I just felt God say, do something. Do something. You've seen it. Now do something. I put him down, he ran off. I'm looking out in this area, and I kid you not, we had been driving through mud brick huts, but in the view that I turned around, there was there were no mud brick huts. It was, it's just this expanse of hard red earth. And there's absolutely nothing in a country where the average temperature is 100 degrees a day. 
How does anything grow here? How does anything survive here? How do these people even make it? Why hasn't something else been done? And I had been listening for a week to people telling me about all the different work and all the different needs and, and, and the works that had been done, but the needs that were still there. And I'm thinking, I've got these ideas in my head and I've got thoughts running through my head. Yeah, but why hasn't somebody done this? Why hasn't somebody done this? Why hasn't somebody brought these groups together? You mean to tell me that these people work over here and these people work over here, but yet they're not willing to work together to solve a problem? To help other people survive? No, they, they stay there and they stay there. And I'm telling you, I looked out and I could see it. And I was starting to find a purpose in this void. Here's what I believe about you as a follower of Jesus. You are uniquely and wonderfully made by God. Men and women, every single one of you, no matter who you are, where you come from, your background, whether you know God personally or not, every single one of you were made uniquely by Him. If you have ever thought to yourself, why doesn't anybody else see it? Why doesn't anybody else see what I see? It's because God made you to see what you see. No one else sees what you see because you were the one created to see it that way. So I know how it is. I mean, you go, you go to work, you, you step into your, your office, you get into your car, you get into your police car, squad car, whatever it might be. And you may be thinking to yourself, why don't we do it this way? Why, why doesn't anybody else see it? And maybe in this moment, God is nudging you just a little bit to say, because you're the one who's supposed to get that going. You see what nobody else sees because I made you that way. Don't just hold the problem out away from you and complain about it. Pull it in and do something. And in doing something, you may find purpose in what was previously a void. You may be able to give of yourself fully and what was previously a void. You know, in leadership, there's this thing we do that's really smart. In order to grow other leaders, sometimes we create a void, don't we? Sometimes we create a gap. Sometimes we go away. Hopefully every once in a while you take a break, you go on vacation, and somebody else has to be in charge of something that ordinarily you would take care of when you are away. It is a great way to develop other leaders. A great way to develop other leaders is to create a gap, is to create a void, and allow somebody else to step into it. But I believe that there are things that you are still being invited to step into today because there is still development and growth ahead of you. You see what nobody else sees. Pull it close and give yourself fully to it. Sometime about that same year back home, there was, a, again, I'm, I'm running the outreach at our church and we had a the big economic crash around 2007, 2008. I live in Paulding County, lived there now for more than two decades. Paulding's a bedroom community. First thing to go in, uh, in an economic crash is the housing, right? And it's the last thing to come back. So in a, in a bedroom community where everybody works somewhere else and just sleeps and the kids go to school in the community, when the housing went out, I mean, developers are going bankrupt, builders are going bankrupt. They all have different names today than they did 10 years ago. I don't even know how that works, but they, we, we call them all different things. That was a joke. But, the, uh, but just, I mean, everybody's trying to just figure out their lives. And in my role, I worked with other nonprofits in the community. I worked with, with other churches in the community, just trying to find out the needs from the Chamber of Commerce and the school board, things like that. And there was a community meeting that happened. I didn't make it, but a delegation got sent to me. And they said, hey... Christmas has been canceled. Now, when you cut the Christmas funding in a community, which was what they were trying to describe, things had gotten desperate. 
I don't know how Christmas stuff works in your community, but in, in Paulding County at the time, what happened was a, a group of women who actually worked for all those builders had started a nonprofit to try to serve the needy in the community. But the, they're, they were having a hard time fundraising. Whatever funding goes to other, especially government-linked nonprofits like United Way and, and the way that Section 8 got their housing for Christmas that year, all of that was being stripped away. They said Christmas is being cut. I said, okay. I said, tell me how Christmas normally happens. They said, well, normally... We register people, and then they drive up to the sheriff's office window, they put their name in, and we hand them out their bag of toys, and they get their assistance that year. I said, that sounds great. That's been cut, yes. I said, can I ask a question? Is handing a black bag of toys, maybe gently used, out of the window where people also pay their traffic fines the best we can do at Christmas around here? I said, you're coming to me for help. Yes? The answer was yes. From all these different nonprofits, different backgrounds. I said, okay. I said, we'll take it, but we're going to throw a party. We're going to throw a party. It wasn't my idea. The idea had come from an eight-year-old girl in Cobb County who had just done her own back-to-school drive. And who said to me, is there any way that we could throw a Christmas party for the kids that I just raised money for, for their back to school supplies? Now I've got a need and an idea and a big gap in the middle, a big expanse in the middle, a big void in the middle. The little girl's nonprofit was called A Fresh Hope. Her parents had helped her create Christmas. I said, let's put our hands together. We created a program called Hope for Christmas. That that year had so many people in our church in a party atmosphere. We took we took apart the worship center. We don't have pews, so it makes things easier. We, we took apart all the chairs. We turned our worship space into a carnival. We had an area where the parents come get the toys for their children. But the kids are dropped off first in an area where they get to shop free for mom and dad. All of this done in a festive atmosphere. They're given food at Christmas. We threw the Hope for Christmas party. We had so many people show up that our pastor got nervous about the weight load on the second floor of our building. Called our builder to find out whether or not we were okay. And at his suggestion, we began to stop people at the bottom of the stairs. We had thousands of people come through. Why? Because we had a need, a big expanse, a big void that we now had the opportunity to give ourselves fully to. And today, that event we call Hope for Christmas is a multi-site event done by churches all over Northwest Atlanta with their in their own way, in their own style, with just a few non-negotiables serving thousands of families every single year. And they're not just being handed bags. They are being given dignity and honor and a celebration and a reminder that they matter. And you know what brings me the most joy? It's when somebody comes up every year it's happened now. We're going on 12 years of this event. And I'll say since about two or three years in, every year this happens, somebody comes up to me and says this, you know what? I was being served a couple years ago. Today, I'm serving why? Because they had a void in their life. They had a big gap in their life. We found our, our purpose and they found their purpose. I gotta tell you, what's happened in Burkina Faso the last several years has been amazing. And it's not about me, it's just I, I could see that something needed to be done. So I just started asking for help. We created a nonprofit because I knew that was a way to get people to give money for, for in order to be a part of it, to have ownership in it. Today in that space where I stood and there was just nothing, there's a garden that feeds 
widows and young women in distress in that community. We purchased chickens and goats and pigs and they raise them and they sell them. We've created sustainable solutions for the people of that community. The people of that community have a, uh, there's a massive amount of physically handicapped people because of the nutrition issues in West Africa, they go lame practically overnight. And so we have given away hundreds now, literally hundreds of hand pedaled bikes that allow people to get around. There was a, a site run there by Compassion International. Compassion International, great organization. They had a site there where they were having a hard time having the kids to be sponsored. We've sponsored every kid in that site now and, and several others. We we're beginning to address clean water. Over the last 12 years, more than half a million people now have access to clean water that did not 12 years ago. I don't know how the mortality rates have changed in those villages, but I know that they have changed. I've had people in those villages say to me, we're tasting food we've never tasted before because they've got water for their gardens out in the bush of West Africa. We found purpose in that space. We came into this broad space and brought ourselves to it as best as we could. And amazing things have happened. You see things that nobody else sees. Other people have tried to see it. Other people have tried to work on it. Other people have tried to solve it. But you see something that nobody else sees. Let me end our day this way. I want to try to create a void, if I could, for just a moment. We've had a lot of talk this afternoon about the different generations. I'm going to go with something that I think everyone will recognize. I want you to all have your own Jimmy Stewart, It's a Wonderful Life moment here, if we could. I want you to create a void. And I want you to get a little bit uncomfortable with it. If you're married, I want you to create a void. You're not there for your spouse. If you're a parent, I want you to create a void. You're not there for your kids. In your community, in your office, among the team that you're a part of, I want you to create a void. Remove yourself from just a moment. You're not there. Without you there, there is a tremendous need. Your wife or your husband, they have a need now because you're not there. Your kids, they have a need now because you're not there. Your church, your community, your office, the team that you're a part of, it's not that you're not needed. There is a tremendous need now because you are not there. You have left a void. There is a gap. There is a wide open space. Now, look at it with fresh eyes. How will you step into your purpose? How will you find fresh purpose and meaning in that space? What is your marriage need? Fill the void. What do your kids need? Fill the void. What does your church need? What are the students at your church need? 
What does the Section 8 community in your community need? What do your neighbors need? Fill the board. What do you need? You need purpose, meaning, and the ability to look back on your life and say, I gave it my all and I held nothing back. Step into that today. Psalm 118 says this. When hard pressed, I cried out to the Lord and he brought me into a wide open Space. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. He'll give you purpose. You'll get to be fully yourself in that wide open space. Step into a void. Thanks, everybody.